Book Two, Chapter Three, Part One of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One by Henry Charles Lee. Book Two, Chapter Three. Privileges and Exemptions. Part One. Before the revolution introduced the theory of equality, class privileges were the rule. Public burdens were eluded by those best able to bear them, and were accumulated on the toilers. The mortmain lands held by the church were exempt from both taxation and military service. And, though Philip V, in a concordat of 1737, obtained the privilege of taxing such as might subsequently be acquired, the repeated decrees for its enforcement show the impossibility of enforcing it. The complete immunity of ecclesiastics from taxation was emphatically asserted by Boniface the Eighth in the bull Clericus Laicos, and, although this was revoked by the Council of Vienne in 1312, care was taken to enunciate the principle as still in vigor. Yet, in the kingdoms of Aragon, they were subject to all imposts on sales, to import and export dues, and other local taxation. And, when resistance was offered to this, Charles V procured from Adrian VI in 1522, and from Clement VII in 1524, briefs, confirming their liability. Hidalguia, or gentle blood, conferred a multiplicity of privileges, including exemption from taxation, royal and local, with certain exemptions that were largely evaded, and the labrador, or peasant or commoner, was distinctively known as a pechero, or taxpayer, that in such a social order the Inquisition should seek for its members all the exemptions that it could grasp was too natural to excite surprise, though it might occasionally provoke resistance. As regards freedom from taxation, the subject is complicated by questions concerning royal and local imposts, and by varying customs in the different provinces, and by the distinction between the active officials of the tribunals known as titulados y asalaridos, and the more numerous unsalaried ones, who were only called upon occasionally for service, such as familiars, commissioners, notaries, consultors, and censors. Their rights were loosely denied, and were subject to perpetual variation by conflicting decisions in the contests that were constantly occurring with the secular authorities, provoked by habitual antagonism, and frequent imposition of new taxes, raising new questions. Ferdinand wrote sharply, April 13, 1504, to the town council of Barcelona, when it attempted to subject the officials of the tribunal to the burdens borne by other citizens, in violation of the preeminences and exemptions of the holy office, and he warned them to desist, in view of the judicial measures that would be taken. Yet, in 1508, we find him writing still more sharply to that tribunal, scolding it, because it had taken from the house of the alguazil of the Bailia a female slave, and, without waiting for formal judgment, had sold her without paying the royal impost of twenty per cent, a disregard of the regalias not permitted to them. They had also issued an order on the custom house, to pass free of duty certain articles for an inquisitor, which was against all rule for, even if the goods were needed for the support of the officials. It was a matter for the farmers of the revenue to decide, and the issuing of such passes would be fruitful of fraud and loss. These instances indicate the uncertainties of the questions that were constantly arising in the intricate system, or lack of system, of Spanish taxation. To follow the subject in detail would be an endless and unprofitable task. 
I have collected a considerable number of more or less contradictory decisions of this early period, but the only deductions to be drawn from them are the indefiniteness of the exemption and the earnestness of the effort made to extend it by the Inquisition. The matter evidently was one in which there were no recognized rules, and, in 1568, Philip II undertook to regulate it, at least in so far as concerned royal taxation. He defined for each tribunal the officials who were to be exempted from all taxes, excise, and assessments, and forbade their exaction under pain of fifty thousand marviedis, and punishment at the royal discretion. But this exemption was granted only during his good pleasure, so that he retained full control, and admitted no privilege as inherent in the Inquisition. His enumeration, moreover, comprised only the titulados y asalariados, holding commissions from the Suprema and in constant service, and omitted the familiars and others who greatly exceeded them in numbers. This attempt at settlement left the matter still undefined and provocative of endless strife. It said nothing as to local taxes. These and the royal taxes were often indistinguishable, or so combined that they could not be separated. The unsalaried officials were not specifically declared to be taxable, and were always striving for exemption. And when, in the growing needs of the monarchy, new taxes were imposed, there came ever fresh struggles conducted with the customary violence of the Inquisition. May 10th, 1652. The royal council earnestly represented to Philip IV that it had already laid before him certain excesses of the inquisitors of Suenca, to which he had not seen fit to reply. Now the corregidor of Suenca has reported other excesses requiring immediate remedy, for they have issued an order, under pain of excommunication and other penalties, that the collector of the excise on wine, imposed for the pay of the troops, shall not collect it of the salaried officials of the tribunal, although they are laymen and subject to it. They pretended that they were not liable to the alsavala, or tax on sales, but they were defeated in this suit on this before the council of Hacienda. And if this is permitted, all the other tribunals will attempt the same, and with their exemption will come that of their servants and kindred and connections of all kinds, with frauds and concealment as usual, resulting in increase of charge to other vassals and damage to the treasury. For it seems as though the sole object of the inquisitors is to diminish the royal patrimony. Similar troubles attended to the levying of the Servicio de Miones, an exceedingly unpopular impost on wine, meat, vinegar, and other necessities. When, in 1631, the tax of media anata, or half a year's salary levied on appointees to office, was imposed, there was a discussion as to whether it was applicable to the Inquisition. This was settled in the affirmative, and the Suprema made no objection, for its collection was taken from the Sala de Madia Añata, and was given to Gabriel Ortiz de Sotomayor, appointed by Inquisitor General Zapata, and when he, in the course of a few years, became Bishop of Barajos, the business was entrusted to the Inquisitor General himself. For a while, the payments were made with some regularity, but in 1650 an investigation showed that for a long while it had been quietly allowed to drop, and, as it was in the hands of the Inquisitor General, there were no means of enforcing an accounting. For a year Arci e Reynoso eluded the efforts of the Sala de Madia Añata to obtain information, and finally, May 17, 1651, the king ordered him preemptorily to pay his own media añata, due since 1643, to make the other officials do so, and to furnish the required information to the sala. On receiving this, he said there were difficulties in making ecclesiastics like inquisitors pay, but he would consult the Suprema and reply in July. July passed away, 
and the sala again applied to him when he replied that as concerned the familiars and other secular officials orders had already been given and collections made but as to clerics there were scruples about which he would advise with the king he failed to do so and in october the king was urged to repeat his demand for immediate payment the outcome of the affair was that ecclesiastics were exempted and laymen had to pay while familiars who had no salaries were assessed nine ducats so arci irinoso succeeded in eluding his tax collection moreover from the laymen was not easy and january twenty eighth sixteen fifty four the suprema issued general instructions to deduct it without exemption from the salaries this only transferred the indebtedness from the individuals to the receivers or treasurers of the tribunals who seem to have been equally slow to pay and in sixteen fifty five an inquisitor in each tribunal of castile and the colonies was designated to collect the money from the treasurer and remit it at once it is safe to assume that the receipts were trivial and the whole business affords an illustration of the methods by which the revenues of spain were frittered away before reaching the treasury whether productive or not however the media anata remained until the end a permanent charge upon the lay officials in valencia in seventeen ninety it had for ten years amounted to an annual average of ten libras with regard to local taxation contests were renewed at every new impost with varying success and a single case will elucidate the character of these struggles in sixteen forty five the cortes of valencia agreed to furnish for six years twelve hundred men to garrison tortosa reserving the right to impose whatever duties or excise might be necessary to defray the expense in order that the clergy might be included the assent of archbishop aliaga was sought which he granted with difficulty and only on condition that within eight months the confirmatory papal brief should be obtained which was duly accomplished to meet the charge an excise known as the sisa del corte was levied on all goods cut for garments the tribunal refused to submit to this and pointed to its contributions to a loan of twenty thousand ducats made by the inquisition to the king in sixteen forty two and to its payment since sixteen forty three of five per cent of the salaries for the maintenance of certain mounted men the city yielded for a while and then a compromise was made the ecclesiastics at the time were paying eighteen diners on the libra or seven and a half per cent while the officials of the tribunal were to be taxed only six diners or two and a half per cent to maintain their principle of exemption however for some years they had their garments made in the name of other ecclesiastics and paid the eighteen diners but in sixteen fifty nine they grew tired of this and paid the six diners for themselves first registering a protest that it was without prejudice to their privileges and exemptions this continued until sixteen sixty eight when suddenly on june nineteenth the fiscal of the tribunal summoned the collectors of the sisa del corte to pass freely within twenty-four hours the cloth cut for the garments of benito sanguino the alcade mare under pain of five hundred ducats on the twenty-first the syndics of the city and the collectors interjected an appeal to the king in spite of which the next day the mandate was repeated this time giving twelve hours for obedience and adding excommunication to the fine another appeal was interposed and the regent of the audiencia applied for a competencia or orderly method of settling disputes as provided in the concordia but notwithstanding this the next day the excommunications were published 
and the names of the collectors were affixed to the doors of the cathedral as under the anathema of the church. The final outcome is of little moment. The interest of the affair lies in its illustration of the persistence of the Inquisition and the violence of its methods. In this respect, the case is not exceptional. The formularies of the Inquisition contained a full assortment of arbitrary mandates which it employed, in place of seeking the legal courses prescribed by the Concordias, by which the King and the Cortes sought to preserve the peace. One of these, drawn in the name of the Tribunal of Yarena, addressed to the Governor and Magistrates, recites that complaint has been made of the imposition on officials and familiars of a new octroi on meat, and proceeds to assert that, by immemorial custom and royal cedulas, the commissioned officials are exempted from paying any taxes, excise, imposts, and assessments, whether royal or local or otherwise. The magistrates are commanded within two hours to desist from the attempt, under pain of major excommunication, and a fine of a hundred thousand marviedis for the governor or his deputy, and of fifty thousand for subordinates, with a threat, in case of disobedience, of prosecution with the full rigor of the law. Moreover, the secretary, or notary of the city, is ordered within the two hours to bring to the tribunal and surrender all papers concerning the assessment on the officials, under pain of excommunication and ten thousand marviedis. Such were the peremptory commands habitually employed, the arrogance of which rendered them especially galling. Not only were these fulminations ready for use when the case occurred, but there were formulas drawn up in advance to prevent any attempted infraction of the privileges claimed by the officials. Thus, this same collection has one addressed to the corregidor and magistrates of a town where a fair is to be held, reciting that an official of the tribunal proposes to send thither a certain number of cattle bearing his brand, which he swears to be of his own raising, and as he is exempt from paying alcavala, tolls, ferriages, royal servicio, and all other assessments and dues, and, as he fears that there may be an attempt to impose them, therefore all officials and collectors are ordered, under pain of major excommunication and two hundred ducats, to abstain from all such attempts, with threats of further punishment in case of disobedience. The enormous advantage which the official thus possessed is plain, as well as the door which it opened to fraud. That the claim was groundless appears by a memorial presented to the Suprema in 1623, a response to a call by Inquisitor General Pacheco on his colleagues for suggestions as to the better government and improvement of the Inquisition. A remarkable paper to which reference will frequently be made hereafter. On this point, it states that, in some tribunals, the officials were exempted from paying the alcavala on the products of their estates, while in others they were not. In some, a portion of the officials have dexterously secured exemption, while others have been compelled to pay by a judicial decision as there is no basis for such claims. If there is no right or privilege of exemption, it is not seen how the officials can conscientiously escape payment, or how the inquisitors can defend them in evading it. Besides the numerous suits thence arising which occupy the time of the tribunals. To cure this, it is suggested that the king grant exemptions to all, for there are not more than two or three in each tribunal to be thus benefited. This suggestion was not adopted, but the claim was persisted, in with its perpetual exasperation and multiplicity of litigation. The large numbers of unsalaried officials, especially the familiars, rendered the question of their exemption of considerably greater importance. They had no claim to it, 
but they were persistently endeavoring to establish the right and for the most part they were supported by the tribunals in the customary arbitrary fashion in the feudal concordia of catalonia in fifteen ninety nine it was provided that levies and executions for all taxes and imposts could be made on familiars and commissioners by the ordinary officers of justice in the memorial to clement the eighth asking for the disallowance of this concordia the suprema proved learnedly by a series of canons from the fourth council of lateran down that the cruci signati whom it claimed to correspond with the modern familiars were exempt it even had the audacity to cite the concordia of 1514 which in reality denied their exemption and it assumed with equal untruth that this was the universal custom in spain yet in a consulta of december the thirtieth 1633 the suprema tacitly excluded the unsalaried officials when it argued that there were not exclusive of ecclesiastics more than two hundred officials in spain entitled to the exemption still the inquisition fought the battle for the unsalaried officials with as much vigor as for the salaried in 1634 the levying of a few reales on a familiar of bisalvero on the occasion of the voyage to barcelona of the infante fernando was resisted with such violence by the tribunal of toledo that finally the king had to intervene resulting in the banishment and deprival of temporalities of a clerical official and the summoning to court of the senior inquisitor in sixteen thirty six philip the fourth to meet the extravagant outlays on the palace of buen retiro levied a special tax on all the towns of the district of madrid in Baezas, the quota was assessed on the inhabitants among whom was a familiar who refused to pay when the local alcaldes levied upon his property he appealed to the suprema which referred the matter to the tribunal of toledo and it arrested the alcaldes and condemned them in heavy penalties then the alcaldes de casa y corte the highest criminal court intervened and arrested the familiar whereupon the suprema twice sent to the sala de los alcaldes declaring them to be excommunicated but the bearer of the censure was refused audience on this the suprema with the assent of the council of castile sent a cleric to arrest the alcaldes and convey them out of the kingdom and on march twelfth in all the churches of madrid they were published as excommunicate and subject to all the penalties of the bull in Choina Domini. What was the outcome of this, the chronicler fails to inform us. But the Council of Castile took a different view of the question when, in 1639, one of its members, Don Antonio Valdez, who had been sent to Extremadura as commissioner to raise troops, was publicly excommunicated by the tribunal of Llerena because, in assessing contributions for that purpose, he had not exempted its officials and familiars. The council thereupon appealed to Philip, who ordered the decree expunged from the records, and that a copy of the royal order should be posted in the secretariat of the tribunal. Yet it was about this time that the claim in behalf of unsalaried officials seems to have been abandoned, for, in 1636, 1643, and 1644, the Suprema issued repeated injunctions that in the existing distress the royal imposts and taxes must be paid. In 1646, it ordered the Tribunal of Valencia not to defend two familiars in resisting payment, and in the same year the Cortes of Aragon gained a victory which subjected them all to local charges. With the advent of the Bourbons, the salaried officials found a change in this as in so much else. In the financial exigencies of the War of Succession, they were subjected to repeated levies. Philip V called upon them for five per cent, 
of their salaries and then for ten per cent to which they were forced to submit in seventeen twelve a general tax was laid of a doubloon per hearth which was assessed in each community according to the wealth of the individual there were no exemptions and appeals were heard only by the provincial superintendents of the revenue the sole concession obtained by the suprema was that where the officials of the inquisition were concerned the local tribunal could name an assessor to sit with the superintendent and it warned the tribunals that any interference with the collection would be repressed with the utmost severity salaries however were held to be subject only to demands from the crown for when saragossa in seventeen twenty seven endeavored to include them in an assessment for local taxation philip in response to an appeal from the suprema decided that those of the inquisition in common with other tribunals should be exempt but that real and personal property including trade belonging to officials should be held liable to the tax towards the close of the eighteenth century various documents show that all ideas of resistance and all pleas of exemption had been abandoned the holy office submitted to ordinary and extraordinary exactions and the suprema warned the tribunals that the assessments were wholly in the hands of the royal officers and that it had no cognizance of the matter the calls were frequent and heavy as when in seventeen ninety four four per cent was levied on all salaries of over eight hundred ducats and three months later a demand was made of one-third of the fruits of all benefices and prebends which was meekly submitted to and statements were obediently rendered under the restoration the inquisition was less tractable in eighteen eighteen an income tax was levied and was imposed on all salaries including those of the suprema which at once prepared for resistance there seems to have been a prolonged struggle with a successful result for on november the seventeenth it issued a circular enclosing a royal order which conceded exemption end of book two chapter three part one